Good morning from Fresh Start. We want to say what a blessing it is to be back in the house of the Lord, be able to stand and do the will of the Father. We ask that you turn with us this morning in your Bibles to this Bible study. We are in 2 Peter chapter 1 this morning and uh, looking very forward uh, to 2 Peter. A lot of things uh, that will be brought out. And uh, before I get started, we'll ask Father for his blessing. Precious Father, we love you and we thank you again for this blessed day. We ask, Father, for your blessings upon the reading of thy word. We ask, Father, that you would open eyes and open ears this morning. Allow your word to land on fertile ground this morning, Father. We love you and we thank you for everything that you send us. In the precious and sweet holy name of Christ, I pray. Amen. We have plowed. We have plowed and plowed and plowed. We dissed. We've separated. We've done all we can to the ground. And this morning it is time to plant some seeds. We hope that seeds be planted this morning to help the whole concept of the gospel, the good news, is to help. And uh, we want to be sure that we bring these out, that it be a help to people this morning. Starting in verse number 1, 2 Peter chapter 1. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. He's saluting all of those that love the Lord and His appearing, but He also is speaking to those that have obtained like precious faith. Now this word obtained in your strongs is 2975. And it means given by lot. So to be obtained, which could only be the election. So what he's talking about, those that have obtained the word of God and God speaks to you, you elect, and God has opened your eyes to the word of God. Peter's talking to you this morning. Amen. Verse 2, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. First of all, Peter asked for the unmeritable favor to be multiplied unto you. And if you are an elect of God, you can understand, you can understand what Peter's saying. I can recall, of course it's not my place to sit and tell you about my life, but I can recall many of incidences that's come in my life, that had it not been for the unmeritable faith of God and His grace and His love and mercy, this old boy wouldn't be here. And it's through God's grace that we continue to stay on course. It's so easy in this life to have the world pull you away, pull you away from the studies, pull you away from God's love and the things that it, by uh, all sorts of hatefulness and things in the world. It's so easy to get your yourself worked up when you look around, but through God's unmeritable favor that he's given to you and I. He asked that that be multiplied, but not only that, but he said the peace. The peace that you can only gain is through the knowledge of the Word of God. That's the only peace in this world that you can have. Oh, I cringe every time my young daughter gets out of the car and takes off. I don't have peace in that. I don't have peace in knowing what's going to happen to 
say financially or anything of that you never know we never know no but the peace that we have inside is to know that we are sanctified by God we are gathered together and we're sanctified by the peace that Christ Jesus only can give to a person by coming to the knowledge of the truth it places peace on your life what peace are you talking about brother Randall well I'm talking about knowing beyond the shadow of a doubt that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life that is the peace that we need to know. If God has revealed things to you, knowledge and understanding, and He is in your life daily, then this peace that you have is something you've grown used to. And it's a wonderful thing. It's a peace that surpasses all understanding. No man can really put his finger on it. Nobody can really place a finger on exactly how to obtain it other than through the knowledge of his word. Rehearsing the word in your heart and in your mind, staying focused, staying sincere, staying sober, and staying in his word. And that's what we've been pounding for the last couple of weeks. And I know kind of sounded as if some kind of boot camp of some sort. I don't mean it to be that way. But the only way I know to get my point across is is to continue to fall under the parameters of what God's Word teaches us. And through all of the apostles, they all teach virtually the same thing. Get in the Word. Study your Word. Study it, please. It'll be good for you. He said, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God. This is the only way you'll obtain it. The unmeritable favor and the peace that rests on you can only come through the knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3. According as His divine power hath given unto us all things, that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Again, through the knowledge of him. Again, studying his word. How do you gain knowledge of God? Very simple concept. This is not a college course. This is not something that's over your head. Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. You love Christ Jesus, you should love the Father. And through the knowledge of him that hath called us unto glory and virtue. There is a calling upon man today. And the calling is, is to broadcast. Plant the seeds. Broadcast the seeds. Send out the good news, the message. Through the knowledge of him that hath called us unto the glory and virtue. Now this word virtue in your strongs is number 703. And this is valor. This word virtue is valor. We'll be using it again here in just a moment. Verse number four, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. <laughs> that by these, these what? These three, grace, peace, and divine power. By these three, you might be partakers of the divine nature. Had an escape the corruption of that is in the world through lust. It puts a shield upon you, friend, a shield of protection that you will not entertain the lust of the world. 
You will not be a part of the filth of the world. You don't no longer want to be around that kind of thing. Separate yourself, the word says. Come out from amongst the world, be ye a separate people. These precious promises are exactly what they are. They are precious promises. If Father gives you a promise, friend, you can bank on it. Amen. It's something that you will be able to obtain through the good works that you do. Brother Randall, I don't think we've got to work. I know you talk a lot about that. I don't think that I've got to work my way into heaven. Nobody said anything about working your way into heaven. Let me put it to you like this. When you come to the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you have a desire inside of your heart. You have a desire in your spirit to do the will of the Father. Amen. That is the work he's talking about. Now, if you're lazy and you don't want any part of it, friend, get out of it. It's not that easy. You can't just walk away from it. For once you have surrendered your heart and your life to God, you have put out an oath that you would do what God said He wanted you to do. What is it God wants me to do, Brother Randall? 2 Timothy 2 and 15, study to show yourself approved. A workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. When in the world would I ever be ashamed? I mean, is there going to be a test one day? Yeah, there's going to be a test. It's going to be what's called the hour of temptation. That final hour before the coming of the Lord. He wants us to know his blessings. He wants us to know, do not be misled. Do not be ignorant of the blessings of God. They're there for you. Right. It's up to you to obtain them. If you don't have them, it's not anyone's fault but your own. Right. And that's as plain as I can possibly say it. It's important that we know what God's promises are. Verse 5. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. <laughs> you must add this to your faith. Why is that? This is, we're going to call this virtue great courage. Because when your faith is going to be tried, it's going to take great courage on your part to withstand the wails of the devil. Amen. It's going to take the courage that you have and your faith. These two are going to work together. Do you understand that? Say amen. amen. I'm telling you, friends, it's not going to be a joke. Right. It's going to be only the strong will survive. Brother Randall, that's awfully harsh. Your adversary, the devil, he is like a roaring lion. Amen. Going to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. He's after you. Is he after the world? No, he's got the world right where he wants them. He's after you, my friend. He's after you that have the promise. He wants to steal your joy. Let no man steal thy crown. It's important that we realize that there's an enemy in this thing and he's out to get you. Yes. He's out to get your soul. Yes. Well, what about to... What about to... Is once saved, always saved, Brother Randall. If you're resting upon those kind of things, my friend, you've not studied out the Word of God. If you're out teaching those kind of things, you've not done your homework. There will be many that have loved the Lord and professed His name. But the Lord said, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. 
or I never knew you. That would, would have to be the worst thing for an individual to sit in the house of the Lord for 50, 60, 70 years and never come to the knowledge of the truth and have that ring in their ears. Oh my goodness, my friends. It's as simple as following this course right here that Peter's given. I want you to be attentive to me. Listen to what I'm trying to tell you. He said in 5, he said, Beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue... Knowledge. Huh? Knowledge. Knowledge. That's right. Knowledge of what? How to build a house? Knowledge of what? How to save money? And be a good steward with your money. No, he's talking about knowledge of the word of God that will help you endure to the end. Matthew 25, there's five that are wise and five that are not. Which one are you going to be? Which one do you have a desire to be? Should be in the hearts of the elect to be those that have the knowledge of the word of God. Amen. Have the understanding, have an open mind to God's Word. And have a full barrel of oil to help you. Well, the Bible says that no man knoweth the day or the hour that Jesus is going to come. You're exactly right. Only the Father Himself, the angels, or even Christ Himself does not know the hour. But, we can prepare ourselves for that hour. Yeah. We can prepare ourselves for that time that's coming. How do you do that? By studying His Word. Right. Knowing, knowing these things will, that will transpire before the coming of the Lord. Amen. And being prepared for these things. Keeping an eye out. Being a watchman for the Lord. And understanding that He's prepared it for you. Amen. He's laid out a table for you in the presence of your enemies. Right. And it's up to you to take this and learn from it. Verse 6, And to knowledge, temperance. You know what this temperance is? This is self-control. Can you control that flesh that you live in? Or do you whine and cry every time you get a sniffle? Can you control that desire that you have to lust after the flesh? Or can you place it like it needs to be? My friends, there's going to be a time when the flesh is going to cry. And it's going to want. There's going to be a time coming real soon. Not everybody's going to be able to pass that course. It's going to be hard for some. They've had it pretty good all their life. And then to put themselves in a place where they can no longer obtain the things that they want, and that's, when it's, that's when it's going to be bad. That's when that test is going to come. Six, he said, add to knowledge temperance, and to temperance, patience. Now, this patience is not just being patient, but it's steadfastness. And God does not want, nor does He like, a quitter. So to be a steadfast person you ought to know beyond a shadow of a doubt the promises that God has promised. Therefore, you can stand on these promises. And you are steadfast. And to patience, godliness. Carrying yourself as a child of the king. That's what he's asked you to do. Seven, he said, and to godliness, brotherly kindness. 
and to brotherly kindness, love, charity. Paul wrote about the same thing over in Romans 12. I'm going to read it real quick. Romans 12, 10, and 13, 10 through 13. Be kindly affectionate one toward another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. Not slowful in business, fervent in spirit serving the Lord. Rejoice in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, Distributing to the necessity of saints given to hospitality. Paul has wrote about the same thing. These things that we ought to obtain as a child of God. Again, he said in 7, he said, To godliness, brother kindliness. And to brotherly kindliness, charity, which is love. Now, verse 8 is what I want you to wake up and realize what's happening. This is the result. If you will do what is written in the scriptures, this will be the end result. Verse 8. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you do these things, why have we been plowing so hard? Why have we been tilling the ground and disking and getting it all prepared to be able to plant this seed right here? So that people will understand that it's not just Randall that says these, but Peter has said it also. The great apostle. That's what we're going to call him here at this church. For he was a great apostle. Apostle. No longer a disciple. No longer a disciplined one in that to be taught, but an apostle. Yes. One who brings forth the word of God. He said, for if these things be in you, if, there you go, if these things be in you and abound and they stay in you, did you get that? If they stay in you, they make you that you shall neither be barren. What's it mean to be barren, Brother Randall? Never producing. Not producing a thing, my friend. Not producing a thing. Amen. Got saved 50 years ago. Ain't never told anybody about Jesus. Got saved 50 years ago. Never have it opened my Bible and studied the Word of God. Never really had nothing to say about the Lord. Never could get into conversations about the knowledge of the Word of God because I've never studied it. That's sad. He said, barren nor unfruitful. Jesus told us to be something. I use it as a fruit inspector. For he said, you'll know a tree. By the fruit that it bears. That's right. You get around me long enough, friend, I, 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 can't, I can't keep from it. I'm sorry. I, it's just me. And maybe some people distance themselves from me because of that. I'm going to talk about the Lord. I'm going to lift him up. Amen. Why? Because Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. Right. <laughs> but when you start talking about Jesus and you get that zeal, and that love in your eyes, you see the eyes is the windows to the soul. Yes. So when you begin to talk about the Lord and you profess his name without any utterance, without any disturbance, when you are able to do those kind of things with joy, it doesn't matter about the things you have in the driveway. It doesn't matter about the, the, the stuff you have in the 401k. You're laying up treasures in heaven. Amen? Amen? That's what it's all about. Yes. Why is that? Because your works do follow you, Brother Randall. Right. They follow you. It's important. 
He said here, For if these things be in you, and ye abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge. How do I gain knowledge, Brother Randall? Through these seven things that Peter has laid out for you. Oh, seven. <coughs> Spiritual completeness. Seven of them. You think it was by chance? No. It's spiritual completeness in a whole for a reason so that you can gain it. If you practice these things in your life, please refer to 2 Peter 1 in these first seven verses. Refer to these when you start stumbling and wondering what it is that I need to do to gain more knowledge about the Lord. How can I do that? It's right there. If you have the same book that I got, it's right there. He said, you won't be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. To be unfruitful is a bad thing. Yes. To be unfruitful and unknowledgeable is a bad thing. Why is that? Because Christ told us in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. In my Bible, I've got written beside it, no excuses. There's no excuses, my friends. Verse 9. For those that want to just lay down and, and, and just slumber and have no desire to study, but just listen to the minister. You see, these words that come from the Spirit of God through this pulpit here is to feed you. And if you only get fed once a week, you're starving to death. Amen. If you only eat once a week, I hate it for you. But verse 9 is the conclusion of those that do not understand. He said, but he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and have forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. When you're blind and you can't see afar off spiritually, when you don't study the Word of God and you don't stay in God's Word and you don't practice God's Word and you don't come to the house of the Lord, you don't hear God's Word, you don't want nothing to do with it, but yet you are saved. The Bible says here, you're liable to fall right back into the old sins that you ask the Lord to purge from your life. You see how that works? It's a dangerous thing, my friends. It's a dangerous thing to play church. Right. Verse 10, he said, Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and the election sure. I've got that highlighted. See, I, I got mine highlighted. You want to make your election sure? You want to make... You say, well, election? I've not been elected. God elected you. He chose you from the first earth age because where you stood in the revolt, where you stood when Satan was going against the throne of God, if it truly, truly bothers you to see somebody hurt, if it bothers you and you want to get involved because you see somebody doing wrong, if you have that heart and that desire to do good and to see good prevail, then you very well may be an elected of God. Some people can stand back and just see things go on and say, well, it's not at my house. Just close the door and turn the television up. We don't have to listen to it. A lot of people like that today. Some people run to the fire. Some run them far away. Okay? Verse 11. For... 
So an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly in the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. <laughs> you know what this word entrance is? It's a gate. It's a gate. Read it like that. For so a gate shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This gate that is given is an open gate, but straight is the gate. Straight is the way. He said in John 14 and 6, he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father except by me. This is this gate he's talking about. Now, we have already talked about how that some assume that they're right with God, but on that day, he tells them, depart from me, for I never knew you. Keep that in mind. Do not fall in that category. In John 10 and 1, I'm going to read something to you. Jesus said, Verily, verily, that means truly, truly, I say unto you, He's talking to you. Are you listening? He that entereth not by the door, which is Christ, that gate, into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is as a thief and a robber. Amen. Well, I was saved. I I love the Lord. I didn't have hatred in my heart. I love God. But you never studied. You never seen what this letter has to say to you. You never wanted to know. You never applied this letter to your life. We must be doers of the word and not hearers only. I know. It's in the same old message. He said the same thing last week. Said the same thing the week before. And said the same thing the week before. That's why verse 12 is here. Let's read it. He said, Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. How do we teach around here, Debbie? Repetition, repetition, repetition. That's exactly right. We must stay on course through repetition, repetition, repetition. Yes. Not to pound it into the hearts of the people, but the friend that you may be reminded that you can bring into remembrance these things. Boy, I tell you what, I've never heard such things like what you're teaching. Hey, you're all the time in that uh, reminding and reminding and, and repetition. Well, it has to be. We are in the flesh. And the flesh is weak. It does not have a desire to get in this book. You must crucify your flesh, that stinking flesh that you got carrying around. And you must get into the spiritual things that God wants you to know. Right. And it helps you. It makes your life more abundant. You have that peace and that love and that unmeritable favor just falls down upon you. That's how you gain these things. Yeah. 13, he said, Yea, I think it meet. <laughs> Whoa. Peter used that word meat. He didn't say, I think it's just uh, milk or a uh, 2% milk. Oh, I hate that stuff. <laughs> Watered down milk. Uh, uh, that's got to be the worst. Watered down milk has got to be the worst that a body could ever have to take in their life. And I know some people have to have that for, you know, conditions and things. But man. But he says, think it meat as long as I am in this tabernacle. Peter said, as long as I am in this body, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, 
I'm not Peter. I am nothing to that great apostle Peter. But friends, it's my job. I will always keep in remembrance the simple things, the things that we ought to know, the things that we ought to study. How do I learn these things, Brother Randall? By going over them, friends. By reading them. Staying in the book. You have a desire to know. If you have a desire to understand and want to know, Father will not withhold any good thing from you. How do you think that all this unmeritable favor and all this grace came upon Solomon? How do you think he got that? Because he didn't pray for those things. Uh, he prayed for wisdom. Right. You do the same thing. Yes. You do the same thing. And see, doesn't it work? Father, I have no desire for nothing. Father, I have no need. My bills are paid. I've got money in the bank. We're okay. Everything's good. All I need is to know more about you. As a young minister, my desire was, Father, all I want to know is the truth. Amen. Please don't ever let me feed somebody a lie. God help me. And friends, the more I began to pray that prayer, the more understanding that it come to me. And with the mouth that I got... <laughs> It wasn't long, friend. I was just spitting it out, what God wanted to hear and what God's people needed to hear. He said, verse 14, he said, Knowing that shortly I must put off this, my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ had shewed me. And he did. Christ told Peter exactly how it was that he was going to go. Turn with me over to John 21. I want to record this with you this morning. It's very beautiful. John chapter 21. Verse 18. Jesus said, Verily, verily, truly, truly is what he's saying. I say unto thee, When thou wast young, Thou girdest thyself, and walkest whether thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. Right. Verse 19 is where it's at. This spoke he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me, Peter. Follow me. Peter understood how he was going to go. He knew that it was prevalent. That means it's going to happen. He knew that was going to happen. Why? Because Christ told him, you will go as I will. Verse 15, Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. The power then that Peter had in his words are just as powerful as they were back then as they are today. Why? Because it's the Holy Spirit of God that's speaking to you and I and teaching us that we, if we stay steadfast, and we stay in his word that these times of trouble, this time of Jacob's trouble will flow over us like water on a duck's back. It'll be help to you. Peter says, I've got to continue to remind you of these things because it's meat for you. It's helpful to you. Verse 16, for we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. <laughs> yeah. 
First off, he says, for we have not followed cunningly devised fables. Does anybody know what that might be? That's what we call today traditions of men. Cunningly wise fables. How many of you, don't show your hands. How many of you truly believed at one time that there was a rapture that's going to happen? How many of you truly believed that when you died, your soul was still out there on the ground? How many truly believed that once you were saved, that's all you had to do was just get saved? These are cunningly wise fables. It's lies, my friends. Right. Straight out of the pits of hell. And Satan loves that kind of thing. But in the latter part, he said, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. What is he talking about? Not only just the full course that Christ carried himself through his ministry, but there was one particular time that Peter's talking about here. He's talking about in Matthew chapter 17 on the Mount of Transfiguration. He's talking about the example that was given before him and two others of how Christ is going to defeat death, hell, and the grave. Verse 17, for he received from God the Father honor and glory. He who? Peter? No, Christ Jesus. He's talking about the Lord. He said, for he received from God the Father honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him from the exceedingly glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. You can record that in Matthew chapter 17 verse 5. Verse 18, he said, And this which came from heaven, we heard. We who? Peter, James, and John. They all heard it. How'd they hear it? They were right there at the base of the mount. And they seen Moses and Elijah and Christ Jesus. They seen it. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. At the mount of transfiguration. Verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. <laughs> there you go. Not only just the resurrection, but you know what he's talking about here? The more sure word of prophecy which is written throughout the Word of God. He's talking about the second advent of the Lord. He's talking about the second coming of Christ. Whereunto, he said, you do well that you take heed. <laughs> you underline, you might want to underline that for yourself. You take heed. If you'll listen and you'll keep this promise and you'll establish your hope in this promise, you'll do well. He said, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. <laughs> now, we're not talking about uh, over in Isaiah 14. We're not talking about that morning star over there in Isaiah 14. It, you know, Lucifer. Do you know that word is only used there? In my studies, I noticed that Lucifer is only used in that one scripture. One time throughout the whole word of God. It means morning star. You see, he wanted to be that day star. He wanted to be Jesus. He wanted to be him so bad. That he done everything that he possibly could. But he couldn't be. He was not the Father's only begotten. He was not. He would not take his position and accept his position and be glad for his position. He wanted more and more 
and more. And pride overtook him. But for you and I, he said, you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place. In other words, it'll allow you to see, my friends, until the day dawn. What day is that? Uh, Revelations 19, verse 11. Let me read it to you. Uh, let's see what it says here. Revelations 19, verse 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he do judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name that no man knew but he himself. He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Amen. And the armies, those saints of God, and the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, <laughs> white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of his wrath of Almighty God. That's what he's talking about. In verse 19. Until the day dawn, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord, and the day star arise in your hearts. Hmm. Peter's given us a lot. But he has one more thing he wants to say in this latter part of the chapter. Fix to come to a close. Brighten up for me and listen. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. Do you believe that? Say amen. amen. It's been given to you. It's been shared with you. It's been rehearsed through repetition. It's been given more ways than one. It's not of some private interpretation. As though some people would make you think that, oh, we don't need the book of the Revelation. Why don't we need the book of the Revelation, preacher? Oh, because we ain't going to be here. You see, over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he that will let shall let. You see, many like to insert what's called the church at that place. But that's not what the scriptures is talking about. He that shall let, will let. He's talking about Michael, the archangel. He who has hold on Lucifer, Satan, Apollyon, that day star. He has a hold of him. And he, when he lets, he will let. But you see how scriptures are twisted through different doctrines and different ideas. And it leads people to believe a lie. You saying that the rapture's a lie, Brother Randall? I, I, I'm not saying. I, what I'm doing is quoting God. In Ezekiel chapter 13, he said, You lie to my people for handfuls of barley and wheat. Right. You do it for money. Amen. You give them hope where there is no hope. Right. You give them hope to fly. It's a wrong, friends. Amen. And it's not of some private interpretation. What's that mean, Brother Randall? That means it's for you to get in there and read and study. 2 Timothy 5 and 17. Study to show thyself approved. But he said in 21, he said, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. It didn't come because man wanted it. But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. These prophecies were given. Well, I can't believe an intelligent man like you would believe a book that somebody's written. Why would you want to put all your trust and time in a book that somebody... There have been many books written. 
but they failed to realize that it was inspired men of God, inspired by the Holy Spirit, to pin down these things. Amen. For who? For you in this last generation. Turn with me over to Daniel, chapter 12. Fixing to come to a close. Daniel chapter 12. These are the things that were inspired, not only just here. This is just one example. I'm going to share it with you real quick. Daniel chapter 12 and verse number 8. And I heard, but I understood not. <laughs> you see how that confirms the word? It, because it was the Holy Spirit of God that delivered these. He said, I heard. But I understood not. <clears throat> then said I, O oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? Question. Verse 9. And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. You see, these words and this understanding of this prophecy that I'm fixing to give you was sealed up. But it's open today. It's open now. Why is that? Because you are in the end generation. You see, it began in 1948 with the establishment of Israel becoming a nation. And the parable of the fig tree it shot forth, did it not? Verse 10, he said, Many shall be purified and made white and tried. And that's true. Got in discussion this morning in our Sunday school hour, and I can't stop but think and believe that Ezekiel chapter 13 is going to come to pass. Excuse me. Ezekiel chapter 37 is going to come to pass just as it says it would. That valley of dead, dry bones is going to come alive, my friends. When the Spirit of God is poured out on the people and those that came in at the 11th hour, they're going to get the same blessing. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly. Wow, can you see that today? And none of the wicked shall understand. Not one of them are going to even have an inclination that the Lord is in control and that He's coming. But the wise shall understand. That's you, my friends. That's each and every one of you that love His appearing. What's it mean to love his appearing? That means that you are ready. You have everything taken care of and you're waiting on him. You don't have any loose baggage, as one would say. You've got it all taken care of. And you know how he's coming and when he's coming. You know the events that are going to transpire before the coming of the Lord. And you're prepared. Verse 11. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. That's three and a half years, according to the Jewish calendar. That's 360 days a year. That's 1260 plus 30 days. Plus the third. What's the 30 days? It would have to be Daniel chapter 8. Verse 13 and 14. Turn over there to 8, 13 and 14. Then I heard one saint speak, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? Fourteen is your answer. And he said unto me, unto two thousand three hundred and excuse me, unto two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. That extra thirty days. Is for, I believe, the cleansing of the sanctuary. You can agree or you can disagree. Move down to verse 12. 
He said, but blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. That's thirteen thirty-five. That's an extra 45 days after the 30 days of cleansing. 30 and 45 is 75. But they must be divided because one acts in action of the cleansing and the other 45 days. He said, Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh. This word cometh in the Hebrew is 5060. Naga. To lie with woman. But from the Jesinus, the Hebrew Chaldee lexicon, it's in the category of B, not A, but B. To touch a woman, to lie with her, Hebrew custom for the consummation of a marriage. He's talking about the marriage right here. This 45 days. He said, Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. Verse 13. But go thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. This word rest is only in death. You'll only rest in death. And stand. You will stand in the resurrection. In thy lot. At the end of thy days. That's what Peter is trying to say. That these things weren't given. To be held back. They weren't given. For everybody to not know. But it was given for you to understand. That there is a time coming. And it's prophesied. Even in Daniel's prophecy. It's given to you to understand. And to know. Now, I know it's a little deep. I know that goes a little further than some people's studies. But that's okay. Refer to it. Read it and do your best to try to understand. And if you do these things, happy are you. Amen. Peter, he knew what he's talking about. For on that day of Pentecost, he was endowed with the Holy Spirit of God. Before he was a common man. He was just a fisherman. Following that Savior out of love. Did Peter make mistakes? <laughs> yeah. You can see all sorts of mistakes that Peter made. He even mentioned that one on the Mount of Transfiguration. Opened his big old mouth. So I think we ought to just make a, a big monument here. And it, because Moses and Elijah, he said, whoa, 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 whoa. Do that, son. He said, For I have not ascended yet unto my Father. I have not risen. I have not went back and proclaimed my defeat over death, hell, and the grave. But I will. Peter knew exactly what he was talking about. Yeah. And he wants you to know the same. He wants you to understand. All right. Appreciate each and every one this morning. I, I hope this has been a help to you. Uh, next week we'll be in chapter 2, 2 Peter. Until then, may the Lord richly bless.